All right. Hey, that's it. So, hello, everyone. This is Rep Power, and we are on our lunchtime on LinkedIn Live uh, program. And this is where we talk to top thought leaders, authors, best selling authors, business executives, business leaders to find out what they know uh, that. Uh, that can help us get better, help, help us all get better. Things that they do that we don't do that uh, makes them stand out. I want to learn the secrets of their success. And today is no exception. And we're going to try to, I will say, before I get into today's program, we're going to try to do this every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 12 o'clock lunchtime here on the East Coast. I know John is probably 11 o'clock, a little early for lunch, your time, but uh Nonetheless, we're going to try to do the same time, same place, every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. If you like the program, like and share it. Uh, maybe this advice can help somebody that you know. Uh, and I also want to thank Social Live for their help in putting this program on. So uh, I've got John Hall with me today. He's not only a good friend, but he is the co-founder of Calendar.com, co-founder and advisor to Influence and Co., which is number one, one of the number one companies uh, dominating content marketing in the world. Uh, he's author of Top of Mind, which we're going to talk about today, and uh, is a weekly contributor to Inc. and Forbes and uh, publications like Harvard Business Review, Mashable, and Fastco. And he's an all-around good guy. John, it's good to have you, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, congrats. I know uh, you've had a lot going on lately. And... Uh, uh, there's so much to congratulate you about the, the launch of uh, calendar.com and and also the new addition to the family and uh, all of that. So yeah, big congrats to you. Yeah. How do you yeah. keep it, how do you keep it all together? Oh, I've got great people around me. I'm very fortunate to have that. You can get a lot done when people around you are smarter and, and, and work hard. So yeah, it's worked out well. More it's just dealing with the sleep. This is you guys are getting my uh, probably at least B or C game today because the last couple of days you would have got F uh, game with me getting about two hours of sleep with my uh, with with helping my uh, well my kids kept me up all night. Nice, nice. I um, I'm glad those days are behind me. Actually, I have a little more gray hair than you do, so um, it's coming in. It's coming in. I'm already feeling good. Um, so you know we've uh, we've talked a lot and we've gone back and forth on things but um and you do a lot of speaking and writing on building trust and how to engage people that matter to you or matter most to you uh why is that work important to you like why 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 is that one of your focuses and and why is that work important what drives you for that in, in that yeah i mean I, I think that if i could get, a lot of people ask me what would i tell my younger self you know 15 you know, 15, 20 years ago, and it would, there'd be a couple things. One is value the trust that you have in relationships and also to value your time. Um, that's something that I just didn't do at a, at a young age. And as I uh, started understanding and I, making screw ups and, and realizing the people that I needed around me uh, to be happy, because I think that happiness and, and, and also success is, is different um, for different people. And so for, for me, uh, success is being around, you know, great people, enjoying the ride. Like you can do a billion dollar company, but if you hate it, uh, I've talked to multiple people that have done that, and they legitimately didn't like the ride. They were always under stress, and so for me, um, trust is vital, just because um, it, it ultimately will lead to you being truly successful, um, whether it's building a, a company or or just having good people and enjoying uh, your life, and then your time. Like I'm, I'm obsessed now with ROIT. And so the the idea of your return, your return on investment on your time is huge. And people look at ROI as uh, you know is um, money. Uh, I, I think money is at a time is a currency as well. We just don't track it as well as we do money. Right. How did you sort of discover that? I mean, that discover that purpose. I mean, I, one of the things I admire about you is you seem to have this um, really good balance, right, between family and work, and and that's all sort of together um is is some of that time man how do how do you manage all of that i want to dig into your secrets because you've got kids galore you have like what three companies that you're working in how do you get it all done like how do you strike that balance and i, I don't know work-life balance is one of those things but you seem to have it all synced together 
Yeah, I, have, like, so I used to be someone who used to talk about work-life balance. You probably actually could find an article even in the last like, couple of years that I've written about work-life balance. And I, my, my thinking of it, it keeps evolving because a lot of times people are like separate the two, um, keep them completely separate. And like, it's so hard to do that. It's actually, it's very it's hard, hard, isn't it? Um, yeah, and for me, it's okay to have work and life and, and your personal life work together as long as there is a balance. And so, um, you know, you're, the question, uh, you know, one of the questions you're asking, it's like, how do you manage all that? Well, once again, it has to do with the relationships around you and it has to do with how you're okay. spending your time. Priorities, um, maybe. Yeah, well, yeah, when you come to spend your time, you have to be conscious of what you're doing. And when we're doing calendar, like analytics was important to us as a part of the calendar tool because we wanted to know how you're spending your time. So I, would, I actually did this little fun, like this isn't like a, a study that was like a, uh, done by HBR or anything like this. This was me and just going out to people and, and, and talking to them about their time. But when you actually look at someone's calendar and say, here's how you spend your time. You spend five hours here, you spend 10 hours here, you spend eight hours in meetings, you spend this. Are you happy with that? Almost everybody says no. And so I think that's hilarious to me where I'm like, okay, so I'm, I'm out there talking to you and I didn't really run into one person that's like, yep, I'm spending my time exactly where I want to. And I'm like, okay, well, are you really spending it in the most valuable ways for you? Nope. Then what the hell are you doing? And so from my standpoint, um, like I wrote an article and that it, is, it actually was a kind of controversial, I don't know why, but like I track my time at this point down like so like so well. Like I have an actual like every every morning I wake up, here's how I'm spending my time. Mm -hmm. And some people think it's crazy. They'll be like, well, Warren Buffett doesn't do that. Or, you know, this person doesn't do that. Like for me, it's important because and even if I'm allocating it towards just mindfulness time or something like I'm just going to spend 30 minutes to disconnect, walk in the park next to me. It's important because the more you think about your time your, or your, your time as a whole, the more you're going to drive your performance, your happiness, because that affects every part of your life. But we spend, we don't spend enough time actually planning it out and looking at it, which is crazy to me. And, and it took me, you know, till the ages of, uh, you know, in my mid thirties to figure out how important that was. So I, I used to be a list guy, and I think I got that from my mother. But what I've, I've sort of evolved, and, and tell me if this is sort of what you're talking about, I, I've come to realize that it's really not about the to-do list. It's more about blocking off the time that I do certain activity. Mm -hmm. like I block off my time for email. I block off my time for writing. I block off my time for reading. I block off my time for those important phone calls or emails. Is, is that is that how you do yours or you have a different system or is uh so it depends like sometimes if it's like a busy day like i really block it off even in 15 minute intervals like i wrote an article about that um and uh that's worked out well but sometimes it's it's hard to do that like i will block off like for example i'm just looking at um i had my calendar pulled up here and uh, like oh, even like it's funny tonight it's a date night um, and I like I make sure I plan date nights, and that was because the you know we went like four months without a date night, and my wife and I actually like I mean date nights help a ton, and I and she's obviously the most important relationship in my my wife or at least for me she's the most important relationship in my life. You not, no business on those nights. <laughs> yeah, well, then it goes red, and then right after the wife. But uh, no, it's it's wife and kids, and you know, and I'm not even scheduled. Like I generally make sure I schedule stuff with you. So why am I like making sure I schedule stuff with Rhett and not my wife? And it's just crazy. And I think it's more about the deliberate and the priority or, the, or how you can be deliberate about things, how you can prioritize things. And so for me, like I have the end of the day is, you know, going home with the, doing the day, uh, day night, but then I have an actual, um, like for example, I have a project that I've allocated two hours of time for. And that's like, no, and that is actually like, don't interrupt me. Um, time and then there's actually reading time that's 30 minutes after that um, on a certain area I'm trying to educate myself on and so uh, even if like reading you know reading time is not necessarily like a stressful time for me but it's important because I go and I, I'll go and like whether it's a park or some place I'm comfortable read relax and actually uh, give myself some breaks that's smart that's really smart I used to have to take like a Wednesday when I was running the company I used to have to take like a Wednesday and get out of the office because I have the worst, absolutely worst case of ADD in the world, and so anything that's going on, I you know I was I was sort of you know it 
got my attention. So Wednesdays was my day out of the office, and I, I could even sit in a coffee shop and like get important emails. So you do you have to sort of create a system that works for you. I, I, I get that. Even I have in my notes like certain times where I'm standing and sitting because health is very important to me while I'm working. So like as you can, this is my bare desk. So it's like, look at like now I can go down to sitting and now, now I can go uh, up. And that's where like I will even schedule things like that. Cause, and um, I was joking around with a, a parent earlier is I, they said, you know, how are you? Like, I was like, like, did you get tired of st staying up and holding a baby? I go, no, like as crazy as it is, I prep for this by standing with the, that's why like I set the very best up, uh, you know, six months or eight months before I had the kid because now I can legitimately hold a child for like six hours without getting tired because I spend a certain amount of time standing during the day. I, I at least try to stand five to six hours a day. Um, and it's even helped me with um, like weight loss and things. I don't know, like I'm not a health expert, but for me, like even scheduling things like that, like I have red powers, and then in the side invite, it says stand. So I know that I'm standing during this. You must have some 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 uh, biceps now, man. Six no, standing doesn't get you biceps. I'm pretty weak. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell me about calendar. And 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 so when 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 a customer comes to calendar calendar dot com, how do they use it? What's it? How's it help? Is it? You know, we were we've been talking about your system, sort of. What is the what's calendar going to do in terms of helping people manage time and, and, and get that ROI that we were talking about? Yeah. So when you think about the calendar, uh, system, like, calendars really haven't evolved in a while. Like almost every there's so many different like look at your iPhone one compared to your iPhone 10. It's like the evolution between that and the 10 is just like crazy. And when you look at other innovations, it's the same way. And so we looked at um, uh, John Rampton was kind of, he was the in, uh, initial idea and, and kind of visionary behind it. And when, when we um, sat down and actually looked at it, it was like, there really isn't a modern day style calendar. It's the same thing. It's almost like there's, it's not even crazy different from a print calendar. Yeah. Uh, sometimes. And so, we looked at how can like what is what is it you wish the calendar did, and there's some amazing tools that do specific things that you wish the calendar did uh, or, or was doing. And then you have Google, Apple, um, Outlook. You have these big players over here, but there's really not somebody that's truly owning the time and, and helping you analyze like just simply the analytics of being able to look how am I spending my time? How's my sales team spending my time? Their time. This is my best salesperson, and this is my worst salesperson. How like and like when you how are they doing? Yeah. What is it? Is somebody doing different? Well, this person's out or on the phone all day and they're just calling, calling, calling. This person is not on the phone all day. So there's obviously some time uh, things we can evaluate. So there's analytics and actually uh, thinking it through, um, uh, being more informed about your time. Uh, there's things like, oh, for example, like I'm always on the go and I can't. Uh, and I, uh, a lot of times aren't, I'm not taking notes and I have six calls that day and I'm trying to think it's like, I have no idea what happened in call two, three, four, or five. Right. And, I w and I wish it, like, it could actually, so what it will do is it will call in and it will record and transcribe and store it in that invite. And so um, there, there's, and you know, that, that's great for sales, but that's also just great for leaders. And, and you know, anytime you can get something like that where people agree that it's important that we, you know, note this down or take notes here. And um, so there's all these areas like that that are important. And then also just simple things like, my wife's on Outlook, or was on Outlook. I'm on Google Calendar, um, and then like, oh, then one of my business partners on iCal, and it's like they they don't like playing together either. And so like for me, it was great because then you, there's a central place where I can just look at the calendar, and it has all those inputted, and I'm not missing my my t my daughter's t ball tournament and things like that. So I mean, right now we're in alpha, where it, you know we're simply looking at um, you know out the scheduling and, and more of the kind of the simple parts of scheduling but as this tool evolves we want it to be the, the calendar that truly learns with you um and will kind of evolve with the user is there going to be some ai involved where it yeah. does some things for you yep yeah exactly and so we're we're kind of believe i mean we like ai um a lot of times there's a big discussion right now obviously between ai like taking over in this negative way um, we look at AI as a positive thing, but you just you have to have a balance between manual and AI and human interaction. And so there will there will there will absolutely absolutely be an AI element, but um, also we want to you know help the users become better with how they spend their time and not just have you know AI 
only thing for them. And so it, there will be a nice little balance between the two. Okay. That's fascinating. And so how uh, people can go to calendar.com to get on the system, get in the, get, get in to it or. Yeah, I would just uh, check it out. I mean, we love feedback and we're, we're thriving on uh, tickets right now, but Hey, like, you know, we'd love it if it did this. And it, what's great about it is a lot of the feedback we're getting, we're like, we have this in, like, it, it's funny because I've done service businesses in, in the past. And a lot of times you can immediately implement a change in a service business in tech. Yeah. You have to actually plan it out. It's got to be thought out. It's got to be built the right way. And so what's nice is that I mean, the tickets that um, that are helpful and a lot of them are aligned with things that we already have in place. And so that's a really good feeling when you have a, like uh, uh, you, there's a vision of where you're going as a company and right. then things that people are wanting are aligned with that vision. And um, so if somebody was like, oh, I wish you did this. And we looked at each other and was like, oh, gosh, like we didn't even think about that. Now, there has been one or two of those moments and yeah. it's been really helpful. But, um, yeah, I would say go, you know, check it out. And um, there's going to be opportunity that uh, I would just say bear with us. We're, we're trying to learn and we're trying to get better at um, evolving. And um, I think in the next two to three months, it's going to be pretty exciting, the, the uh, evolutions we're going to be making. So I, 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 when you said that, it sounds like there's going to be an enterprise side to it where managers can use it, but there's also the individual side that helps people too. So is that is, that's how it's going to, so you can come in as a company and if you wanted to use it as a company, company wide, you could do it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's something where when you're doing a tech tool uh, in any way, you want, um, especially you, you want to be like, eh, this can solve everybody's problem, uh, which we want. Like if you, the, right. My business partner and I are like when we were talking, it's like we want to we want to change people's lives for the better, and so you just want to be like I want to every we want to target everybody. But then as you think about the the way you should you need to build a company, you have to say hey who's going to get the most value in, in, out of this tool and where's the most growth? And obviously on the enterprise, there's a huge huge amount of growth there. Um, but you also don't want to alienate people and say we're only focused on that. So right now we're in a is in a stage where we have a very good idea what audiences are going to get the best value out of it. We're, we're also listening to um, different types of people so that we can understand maybe there's a tremendous amount of value in this audience. And I think that um, as I've learned with you know building tech products, the more you kind of are listening, open to people, listen, you know, talk to users, and then identify who gets the most value, then you hone in a little more there. That's where um, we're at, but we have a very good idea that you know, obviously the enterprise sales and different uh, industries are going to really value this. Um, but I, I honestly use it just as a person. I mean, my wife uses it, and she's not an enterprise uh, um, person, but uh, she gets the value. So I thank you for that because I, I know that this is this is a real passion and a real thing that you're um, really really focused on right now. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about. Um, the last book, a little bit, if that's okay. Um, yeah, let's go for it. Yeah, so Top of Mind uh, was a was a great book to me because it um, it really brought out to me the importance of as an entrepreneur, as a, as a CEO of the personal brand, and 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 how to sort of go down on that you know go down that path if you want to call it that. Um, in the book, you talk about how consumers have changed and and expectations have changed. What did you mean by that? And and it, for for people that are listening that you know run small businesses, medium sized businesses, uh, who are who keep hearing content, content, content. You got to content. You got to do the. What does that all mean? I mean, I don't. I wouldn't even know where to begin. You know, um, if you'd asked me five or six, seven years ago about writing and content and you got to build that brand I, I just wouldn't have, it wouldn't have really occurred to me that that was important so what why is it important what how do you get started what are there some tips that you might have that can help people and and, and what where do you start yeah absolutely and, and um i mean from the side of the consumers are changing it's trust is becoming so much of a bigger issue and and um, just because, and there's multiple things. You can blame it on politics. Obviously, trust has, uh, there has been challenging media, right. uh, uh, challenging, but also different generations. Uh, in one of my keynote speeches, I give an example of my daughter. 
Um, she's growing up very different than I am, and I need to understand that. Um, uh, understand that. I gave her my Timex watch. I was so excited. I got to give her my uh, Timex watch, and I was like, "Hey, like I was so excited when I was like five or six, and it lit up indigo." And there's a video of this actually online where she goes and she's like, "Call Grandma Hall," and she's trying to get her Timex watch to call Grandma, and then she gets upset at the Timex watch for not calling Grandma. That is a very different like different way we're growing up and so consumers and people are changing and it's gonna uh, ch keep changing because people are different people are, are you know unique in different ways and there's also some trust issues going on and so you've got to focus on areas that will help allow you to build trust content is a key one of those because when you think about it what are who are the people that you trust the most now they're the people that have, to me it's the people who have educated me and made me better it's uh, coaches it's you know it's um experts my parents it's friends who have advised me advisors what do they do well a lot of time it's the advice and it's and it's things that you're learning from them and content is key education is key to that trust and so that's why you have to um, invest in some sort of education some sort of content that is engaging that audience because the psychology behind being top of mind is is the is the goal is to be in everybody's long-term memory now right i want in 10 years if even if we didn't engage each other which we will and I, i'll be good at that and you'll be good at that 10 years down the road i want you to to remember is that oh if something comes up in this area of you know the calendar or even you know me as a speaker with uh, top of mind i want me to be on your mind so you're like you should talk to john hall and that's long-term memory and so it should be all of our goals to get in people's long-term memory, whether it be a customer, whether it be a recruit, whether it be in, you know anybody that's valuable or a stakeholder that can bring value to you um, in the long-term memory. And so doing content um, is one of the best ways to scale it. There's only so many times I can have these sort of interactions. Once again, it goes back to time. I can only have lunch with uh, someone this many times. Content can, can scale in ways that are amazing that, um, like I even gave you an example recently that there's this person that booked me to speak. I did not talk to for a year. And then when I went up to them, um, I spoke at their event again, they came and gave me a hug and they go, oh my God, it's good to see you. The idea that they were comfortable enough to give me a hug and that there was some connection there where I was, and then they immediately go into, I love that article you wrote about this. There was this help article that you wrote. There was this, this another article that I got a lot of value out of. I could tell that they had not value out of something that I had written. Um, and it connected them and it almost created, instead of this point from here to here, these little yeah. trust touch points so that it, it completely changed, like the idea that they ran up and did that. And then they were like, hey, let me intro you to people. Like, they felt it, like they knew you, right? They felt like they knew you. Yeah. Yeah. So that's I don't a know, long answer, but there's some, some value in there. No, no, a lot of value. No, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, I, that's, that's incredible. Is it, how does that apply? to small, but let's say you run a, a flower shop or a coffee shop in, in town, right? How does that apply to you? Like how, um, and I mean, do you, do you, do you need to think of it on a global level or is it, do you write an article? I mean, I, we're talking about writing essentially, we're putting that kind of content out or maybe we can talk about it in terms of video too. Yeah. But, but how does that, how does somebody do that for a local audience? Let's say that's who you're really targeting because that's where your business is and that's who your customers are. You go where your customers are and that's where somebody, everybody asks me like, what should I be doing? Like, should I be writing an article here? Should I be doing a blog? Should I be doing a video? My answer to them is like, I, I don't know your audience yet, so I can't advise. And they always get frustrated and they say out the gate, they're like, you're an expert. You should know this exactly. And I'm like, no, um, experts, are, if they, they give you advice without information, um, they're not experts. We, we need information to make good decisions. And so I, what I would turn on back to them is like, you ask these people, talk to them. Where are they reading content? Where are they engaging in things? Um, what is something that they value? Is it on a video? Is it um, something that they would be on an email list? Is it they- A local blog, a local blog, a local thing. Yeah. So there's different ways to communicate. And also, what do they value? Like, ask them what they trust. Like, for me, getting contributors and influencers to, um, to include me and to, uh, and like, position John, John Hall's speaker or John Hall founder or co-founder of Calendar. Um, when those things happen, benefit happens with me. And so I want to, you know, get others and engage others so that they're, they're referring to me as an expert here. So that's me. 
Um, with others, it might be different. It might say if it's a coffee shop, it might be something completely different um, where it is video and it is, you know, a, a local um, uh, whatever channel. And so I would just say um, really focus on where your customer is and where you can engage in the most and then focus on those channels. Okay. And, and that's actually a great time saver, right? Because you don't need to do all the other platforms, right? You don't need to spend time on platforms that aren't going to bring you any value. Well, there's levels of, of influence. And so you have to decide, are you truly going to engage people there? Or is it a level of uh, perception of credibility? So perception of credibility is like, if you're a coffee shop that doesn't have a Facebook page, that's kind of weird. Like coffee shops should have a Facebook page. So it's like, have a Facebook page. It's the same way where there's a lot of people that I, I know that don't have websites. And I'm like, you don't even have a website. Do you not think at some point this person is going to look at, at you know, you're going to end your buyer's journey. They're not going to look. I mean, if they're not going to look at your site, then whatever, fine. But somebody's going to look at your site. So you should have one up there. Should you invest millions in it? Well, if that's the place that you're going to engage the customers the most, yes. Yeah. If you, they're not there, then no. And so, um, yeah, I would say that you look at it and divide it up as these things are credibility points that we need to have and check them off the box. These other things are where we're actually truly investing in engagement. What does engagement mean? I mean, I, I you know you hear the word a lot, and I think for a lot of people that's confusing. You sure. know, I mean, what I mean, I know there's content, but then what is what? There's a difference between that and engagement. Like, what does that mean? Yeah, I mean, for someone who you're actually going to start forming some sort of relationship with, um, engage like if somebody just reads an article of mine and pops away and they never see me, and that's not engaging. Um, however, if they if they read and they actually start engaging, whether it's commenting or, or, or following me more or paying attention to what I'm doing, um, it, that's more engagement. Like I focus on those relationships and what I can do to get those relationships over just somebody paying attention to my con or paying attention to an article or a, a piece of content. And so I think that from from my goals with engagement, it's to form some, even if it's a minor relationship with someone where they're either trusting me slightly more, engaging more in my content. So they're looking at things that I'm doing uh, more um, and they're kind of coming in my sphere and it allows me to nurture that better. Because once you get that, then you can, in that coffee shop example, you know, once you get a, a customer kind of engaged in what you're doing, let's say they give you an email address to, you know, keep up to date on specials or something like that, um, you're able to nurture them in different ways. And there's so many uh, different options once you get them in that uh, kind of sphere. Um, and so that should be the goal because once you get them in that sphere, there's a, there's a lot you can do. You can create loyal brand advocates that result in referrals. There's all these different um, kind of tactics and things you can do to, to um, build that relationship out once they have some minor form of engagement. So that means that means you should respond to those likes and those those notes or those little comments that you get uh, in a really strategic way. Even if it's a, a thanks or something like that, like look at my LinkedIn like articles. Um, you'll look, I I comment on almost every single one of them. Now it might be one sentence. Like people are like, oh, like I'm a time person where you know commenting on those um, and it's like just putting thanks, uh, appreciate it. You know that takes me two seconds. Like even if I'm copying and pasting it um, into it, it's still me showing that I actually value because engagement is something that's valuable. And so you want to reward. Anytime there's something good that happens, you want to reward that behavior so it it makes it happen more. And so uh, whenever you get a chance to engage, now now if I was writing full paragraphs on any time somebody commented on my LinkedIn post, then I'd be screwed with my time. I would never go home. And so you just have to value your time um, and look at ways you can even have the, the, a slight uh, you know uh, response or something like that, so that people feel that you're people want to feel like you're listening. Well, they took the time to, to write something, right? So they, they're looking for a response. We're, I mean, when I ask you a question, if we're face to face and you give me a blank stare, you know, it's rather annoying, right? You're, you're, I'm looking for a response from the question that I asked. And it's the same thing online, right? If somebody takes the time to, to make a comment or say something, they, they want a response. So it's, a, it's sort of a it makes kind of, kind of sense. Um, yeah, I wasn't I wasn't paying attention. I what? 
But that's right. It's like people want, I mean, and you can scale things these days. Um, there's there's a bunch of tools that helps you scale personalization and things like that, or just getting staff. It's important to have staff around you that knows how you would respond to things. And so even if I was on vacation or whatever, I have someone that would engage for me on my behalf. Um, and so that's where, um, you know, just make efforts to to make uh, people feel listen that you're exactly right. If you get a blank stare back at me or I'm sorry, like I wasn't paying attention, it makes you feel like crap. And so that's why I, even in one on one personal, like, you know, the shoulder look overs. And I used to be that. Yeah. It's like I'm talking to you, but I'm like, I want to talk to that person. Your hands are moving. And <laughs> even just on one on one conversation, work on that. Right. So I. Uh, just a random question, and then uh, I know you've got a busy day ahead. Um, what are, what is the work that 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 you're the most proud of of of, of the things that you've been involved in in the, in the couple of the companies that you've built? What uh, what makes you the most proud and most excited? What what do you kind of think about sometimes, and it makes you smile? Oh, just the people over the years. It's like I mean, I, Influence Co. For example, great people. I mean, Kelsey's uh, Kelsey Myers the CEO there, she's a great um, person. The team around her is great. Um, the calendar team, I mean, my business partner, John, is, is amazing. And the yeah, ranking is pretty, 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 he's great. pretty, pretty good, great, pretty, pretty good guy. I laugh a lot at work. So then and it's due, and part of that is because of him. And so um, he's just fun and he's extremely smart. And so there's a lot of people like that in addition to, um, yeah, I would say that's just the key thing is that the relate, the, I mean, we, for example, like in real estate, I did a bigger deal, made a ton of money. Uh, was I really happy about that? Well, it's great to have money. Money is great, but like I'm more proud of some of the things that have happened in, um, you know, just with the team and like milestones together and the journey together. And so when I reflect on what I value the most, I just look at it as like, you know, even like the team member, team members that started off walking in with doe eyes and not knowing what they were, they were so green and now they're up like making major multi-million decisions and like they're so confident. I can tell you they love their work. That's that's amazing to me because it also like when you get people to a point where they're happy and they feel like they're truly adding value, that they actually have a purpose and that they're valued by me as well. It, then it creates this like ecosystem of awesomeness where you can accomplish a lot more. And so, yeah, I would say that that is, um, you know, that's something that I'm really, really proud of is I've learned a lot of how to surround yourself with amazing people. Did you build the, the culture that you build that the influence code? Did you, was that intentional? Or, or very, very intentional. I mean, the portion Kelsey and I had like you know, people stumble into building a good culture, and sometimes had, it's intentional. So I wonder where. Yeah, we had very aligned visions there, um, and same thing with Brampton. It's like when you when you have the people that are operating the company that are the leaders that are truly operating, not an investor or something like that. But um, when you have those people that w truly care about the employees under them. Uh, or to the side, I mean, like whatever, whoever you're supporting, um, it creates this different thought process. Like you'll make decisions, like for example, we'll lose on some short-term profit to gain long-term, you know, talent and high, you know, and, and that's hard to do sometimes like firing a client that is a drain on, like there's a recently in something that uh, we were doing in one of our companies, there's a client that called up and was just pissed off for no reason screaming at it and the mental drain that puts on that person they're a high paying client so do you um go to that person and say well money is more important no we say you're done you're fired as a client you're not going to be working with anybody here um and that signal and that sign shows that you value the people and i guarantee you even though it's a lot of money that we turned down in that moment um, the equity that we built up with those people that we actually care about them being treated well um, that is more valuable to us. And it's hard to do that sometimes. And you have to pe have leaders with aligned visions on what's important in the company you want to build. So it was very deliberate. And I would advise people is like, it's like a marriage. My wife, uh, you know, our marriage is sacred and important to me. It's so important. It's so important that, but there's similar signs in a business partnership. And even if it's the leaders together, you're dealing, I see the leaders almost more than I see my wife. And so, that's that's something that you have to look and get a line, look at and get a line build, uh, visions on. Well, and I mean that that loyalty that that creates uh, and the the loyalty of the employee experience. I mean that just uh, pays you that pays off 
uh, in dividends. It really does if you can do if you can achieve that. Is there a, is there a secret to sort of hiring the right people? Did it take a lot of time to build those that that the people that really fit into the culture, or is there a, one one tip for hiring that a good team? What's what's your recipe there? I don't know. I'm like different on hiring. Like this is almost like kind of embarrassing, but I I don't even think I've really looked into a resume in the last one or two years. Like um, I, resumes, I don't know. They tell one story, and like I even spoke at a university recently and said that, and I'm sure the career services person was like, oh, "Get him out of here." Um, for me, it's like, um, like, are you trustworthy, and are you going to work, you know, work hard? Are you willing to learn? Can they retain knowledge and have an intelligence to be taught? Like those are things that are more important to me than really anything. Right. Um, they have experience in different things that's super valuable, and also there's certain technical skills. Well, somebody you know with a developer is very different. They have to have that. But I think, and so I don't want to like blanket statement this. Um, but I think that once you identify what the core values in, and I think always willing to willingness to learn and make each make themselves better. I think that is just so key because it, then it makes the investment in time. Once again, going back to the investment in time, if I'm going to spend time in you and you're not going to like actually become the best version of yourself possible, that is not worth my time. And I used to invest like when I was younger in people that really be, that, that just wasn't there. They just weren't motivated. They weren't in the right position. Right. And then you're in time and it's, you're getting zero return on that investment. And so I would just say, you know, get your core values. What's most important. Um, you know, there and then um, for me, it's those things. And then, I, then I look at the other things. Then I look at okay, their expertise, experiences here, um, re you know, references and all that jazz. And so I, I would just say, get those two, get those core, and don't make exceptions. Like I would rather work a hundred hours in one week or two weeks or three weeks to get by to a point where we can get that right person there. Because the drain that you make hiring the wrong people is just, it's significant. And so uh, I would just say be okay and don't make, just because of growth, don't make exceptions. That's sage advice. Well, John, hey, man, it's been great to have you. I, I, we've got to let you go and we've got to close out. But uh, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, I'll have you and uh, when maybe when this evolves a little bit, I can have you and and uh, John Rampton on at the same time. That that would be a hilarious, fun conversation. Right. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, we'd be happy to help. Anything we can do to help you out, just let us know. I'm always happy to keep an eye out. And I just realized all my daughter's pictures are in the background, so hopefully you guys enjoy it. I love it. I, I wish we could get a close up of it. But, uh, it was very affordable, and I feel like there's a lot of love behind it. So, oh well. Uh, but thanks for having me, and I appreciate your time. Yes, sir. And uh, so, everyone, thank you for joining me today on LinkedIn Live and on Lunchtime Lunchtime LinkedIn Live show. If anybody wants to create a logo for that uh, LinkedIn Live lunch, LinkedIn Live or whatever, uh, give it a shot. Uh, I'll, I'll plug you on the show if you send me a good logo. Uh, for that. Um, but this is where we're going to interview top thought leaders, authors, business leaders to find out what they know that we don't. And uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next week. Next week, we're going to be live from Italy on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I'll be there doing a couple seminars. And we're going to be trying to do the show live from uh, Italy. I can't promise that it'll work out, but uh, we're going to give it a shot. So uh, until then,